Sunday, October 17th, 2004, and this is the beginning of our interview with Harold Vick in Chico, California. Mr. Vick is 83 years old, having born in September 18th, 1921. My name is Crystal Heath, and I'll be the interviewer. Um, Mr. Vick, could you state what war and branch of service you were in? I was in the Army, and I was a Staff Sergeant Tank Commander in, in the Philippines. What was your rank? Staff Sergeant. Oh, okay. Um, I was Tank Commander. Did you have any major events happen to you during the war? <laughs> you can name them all. Well, yeah. Yeah, we had a had a few, uh, our tank was, was hit once, but luckily it was with small caliber ammunition, you know, it wasn't the large, am large uh, armor piercing stuff. And we had gone down to pull out a, a tank on baton. And uh, that had been disabled because the uh, Japanese had cut a tree down and left just room for a tank to go through. And naturally, that's where they put the landmine. And uh, the tank, when it drove through there, it blew the tracks off. So we had gone down to pull it out on the bogies. And, uh, our turret was hand turned. We weren't, you know, very. We had equipment almost as good as the Japanese, maybe a little better. And uh, one of the bullets lodged in the cog where you turn the turret by hand. Mm -hmm. So the gun was pointing out in the wrong direction. So anyway, we finally got the tank, you know, uh, pulled out. And uh, we had lots of, we were always the last ones out when we were retreating back into Bataan. We'd blow the bridge and then retreat, which we actually, later on, we got a chance to rebuild the bridges, you know, after we got captured. But uh, well, we had lots of, uh, you know, fights with the Japanese. I, one time I had a banana tree cut off over my head when I was on guard duty about two o'clock in the morning. And of course I was running to get in the tank. We always left the, the door open. Everybody stood guard. didn't make any difference whether you were a sergeant or a private or whatever. So anyway, <clears throat> after I got into the tank, we had two people killed that night, both in a half track. And uh, <clears throat> we finally, why I don't know, they, they put us on the side of the river. We had to cross, you know, so we had to go up to a bridge and go across. And we stopped out in a, in a cane field and, you know, you used hand signals for your driver, you, you know. And I was backing him into a cane field and unbeknownst to us, the uh, Filipinos had a 75 millimeter back out, and they were shooting back over our head, and the concussion almost knocked you down. And we didn't know it when we were back in, you know, into the cane field. But, uh, you know, we had lots of close calls. Uh, it's hard, hard to tell about how many, you know. We were just lucky that we never got hit really bad. You know. Somebody else do you need? Um, how'd you get captured? Well, we got captured on Bataan because we didn't have any food. We didn't. We were on half rations for the last two months before we got captured. We got captured on the April the 9th, 1942, and. Uh, by that time, we were out of food, and finally, uh, MacArthur, which we called MacArthur, we called him Dugout Doug. We didn't call him General MacArthur. 
he was the one left, and General Wainwright was the one that was really in charge. So finally, um, we heard the word blast come over the radio, so we knew that we had to surrender, you know. So we fired bullets into the, you know, armor piercing bullets into the engine on the tanks, cut the gas lines inside and let them fill up with gas, set them on fire so the Japanese couldn't use them. And uh, then we got captured and it, uh, actually we had to, we were around by the South China Sea. Actually we had to uh, uh, take a truck which we rode, we started walking, then we took a truck, one of our trucks, and it was it had a lot of ketchup bottles in it. So naturally, we drank the ketchup, we were hungry, you know. And uh, finally we got to the Japanese down at Marvelous, and they had shot some and bayoneted some, you know, just to make sure that we knew we were prisoners. And uh, then we started on what they, was later called the Bataan death march, which was a pretty good word for it. And uh, I was only with one other person that was out of my company, a prisoner by the name of Bill Glenn, which he's deceased now. But they would start us marching, you know, and we marched. I had two canteens of water and he had one. And that lasted us for five days. Actually, there was artesian wells bubbling up along the march, but if you, some of the prisoners got so thirsty they would run for the water, you know, and that's when the Japanese would shoot them or, or bayonet them, you know. So we knew not to do that, you know, so we were just rationing ourselves with water, take a little sip now and then, you know. And a Japanese truck drove by and threw out a can of, of uh, Oh, salmon. And this friend of mine, Bill Glenn, he caught it on about the second bounce. The reason the Japanese threw it out, they wanted to see us scramble for it, you know. So he caught this can of salmon and that was almost our undoing because it was kind of salty. <laughs> it made us want, want water a little bit worse. And uh, so we, but we marched for about, uh, well, five days. In the sixth day, we got to where they had a little train. And uh, their boxcars are not as large as ours. You know, they're smaller. So they were herding us into the boxcars using a cattle prod, you know, or similar to, so they could pack as many in there as they could. So then they closed the door, the Japanese guard closed the door all except about a foot, and he stood in the door. And we actually had people die standing up because they were suffocated, you know. Just just couldn't get any air because there wasn't any air in there. So anyway, we we finally got to, to uh, after the train stopped, we marched about seven more miles to a place called Camp O'Donnell, which was, uh, uh, aptly named the, 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 I forget what they call it, the, the, the Camp of Death or something. But it, it was it was named pretty good because we lost about 58 a day, you know, prisoners. And the only time that you got any bread was if you were on the burial detail. And people, you know, you had a dead person in the bag here and a post you know, a, a stick running from the shoulder of the prisoner who wore in the front back to the one in the back with the dead POW in the hole, and, and we would take those out and uh, dump them in the hole, you know, which had water. Prisoners had dug the holes. And the Philippines has lots of water, you know, it seeps up from the ground. and. Uh, we had to dump them in the hole, and they'd actually give you a, a, a bun, a piece of 
some bread. Other, otherwise, we'd eat. eat uh, they had a bowl about uh, oh five inches across and maybe three inches deep, and uh, our prisoners were cooking the the rice. So you'd go by on each side of what they call a, a rice quali, which is a big black quali they cooked the rice in, used a, a paddle, you know, to and uh, the president would go by on each side and they'd cut the have to, you know, fix the bowl where it was even across the top. And then he'd cut it half in two and they'd give half to this person, half to this POW over here. And then you'd go up a little further and they had seaweed soup, which <laughs> you probably don't know what that is. But they'd give them, we'd get a bowl of seaweed soup. And the idiots were giving us brown rice instead of the white. They were eating the white. If we hadn't had the brown rice, which has all the nutrients in it, we would have, you know, it lasted as long as we did. But they gave us, thank goodness, they gave us the brown rice. But uh, after we were in O'Donnell, you, know, you can stop me. Can you? No, no, keep on going. After we were in O'Donnell for a while and lost a lot of prisoners, you know, POWs, why? Uh, Incidentally, on the march, I forgot this, one of our officers dove off of a bridge head first, and it must have been 100 feet. Of course, he died right away, you know. But uh, we moved from O'Donnell to what they called Camp Cabana Tawan, and it was another unfinished place, you know, and we slept outside on the ground for a while. I had a piece of cardboard put under my head, but it rains all the time over there. You know, you, it's always raining. So it wasn't long till that cardboard was gone. Then they moved us into some old barracks that weren't finished, and they had bamboo slats about an oh, inch and a half across, and then, of course, there was a space. And uh, we were sleeping on those, and when you'd get up, you could see, you could see, you know, where the bamboo slats were on a person's body, but um, we stayed there for a while, and then they sent us out on a, uh, what, to rebuild a bridge that we had blown up called the Columpet Bridge, and this friend of mine, he went out also, and my tank driver, the one, Earl Smith, had drove a tank for me all during the war, which he was an excellent driver. Uh, he uh, he went with us, and uh, Bill Glenn, this friend of mine that I had made the march with, he was out on the detail. There was a hundred of us out there. So during the time we were there, and, and, you know, they had us rebuilding a bridge, wading in water, you know, nothing but a g-string, and actually the water, we were all sunburned. The water felt kind of good when you'd wade out in the water, you know because we were so sunburned. But Bill Glenn got uh, malaria, which all of us had, you know, some worse than others. And I never noticed anyone that had malaria chill as hard as he did. You know, his teeth were chattered. So I had traded something, I don't remember what it was, from a, a Filipino and got a hundred uh, uh, you know, the, oh, what do you call it, I forget what, uh, 100 capsules for malaria, you know. Mm -hmm. So I uh, gave him some, and he gradually got a little bit better. And during the time we were there, oh, incidentally, I forgot to tell you, too, we were all from Salinas National Guard drafted into the regular army in February of 41, sh shipped to the Philippines in September with the tanks, which the Philippines is no place for tanks, too many rice paddies. But anyway, Rick Arrington, uh, we'd all gone to high school together, most of us, and the Japs had, had taken my wallet, took a few dollars in it out, you know, and took my class ring 
threw the wallet down, and my wife's picture was in. Of course, we got married in June of 41, so we've been married 63 years. So Rick Arrington came, uh, you know, in, in, on the march in back of us, and he picked up the wallet, and he recognized Sue's picture, so he brought that to me at command. In O'Donnell, I guess it was, yeah, in Camp O'Donnell. And carrying that around all during the time I was POW mm -hmm. didn't hurt, you know. So, anyway, uh, back to the Clump Bridge detail. Uh, there was a hundred of us there. One fellow was married to a Filipino woman, and we didn't know it. And he escaped. And, and, there was a river ran right along where we were in a POW camp. So he escaped with, in a bunker boat with her. So the next morning the Japanese count us off three times to make sure someone was gone. So they just went at random. Uh, they uh, picked out three or five people, you know, out of the 99 that was left. And my tank driver was one of them. So they just uh, took him out and shot him, you know, executed him. Mm -hmm. and that kind of teaches you not to escape. That was the purpose, you know. So they went, and uh, I'll tell you later how I met his daughter. was three years old when he was left to go over there. But anyway, uh, after after uh, they brought us in from the Columbia Bridge detail, and uh, this friend of mine, Bill Clint, he he had a they had mango beans over there, what they call mango beans, mm -hmm. and in an old dirty sock he had about that much, you know. So uh, he and Glenn broke off. Another friend of mine, uh, you know, they were all friends, we were all friends, but they were close friends. Uh, we cooked those mongo beans right under the Japanese in nose, you know, in a, in a, uh, with charcoal. And um, then I had very, very, pretty bad at that time. I had what they called foot flop. You know, I had wet, dry, berry, berry. Everybody had it, and dry berry, berry. Some people, when they would die, would have it so bad they'd just swell up all over, you know. And, and after that happened, you know, it hit the heart while they were they were dead. You know, you see in those pictures in there that's how some of them died. We had berry, we had berry, berry, malaria, dengue fever, uh, pellagra, scurvy. You name it, we had it, you know. Of course, you don't get enough food, you get all that stuff from not having enough food. So, uh, uh, anyway, uh, I had berry berry and I had what they call foot flop because I had wet berry berry, my legs were swollen. And it sounded like a horse walking, you know. So, anyway, they took a hundred of us decided to take us down to uh, Mindanao to uh, Davao Penal Colony, which was an old Filipino prison. And uh, so we were in Bilibid for three days there in the Philippines. They called it Bilibid Hospital. They didn't have any medication or anything. But this old American doctor, he had had some inner tubes some way. So I still had my old uh, Army shoes. So he fastened the uh, rubber down around the bottom of my feet so it would, and run it up. He had two old belts he had somewhere, fastened them to my belt. So when I would, and put tension on them, so when I would walk, it would pick my toes up, you know, and help quite a bit. Plus, when I went down to the little boat that we took down to Men and Now, a couple of the other POWs let me put my arms over their shoulders, you know, so I, that helped quite a bit. And uh, so we got on this little fishing boat to go to Mindanao. 
to the Val Penal Colony, which was inland about 50 kilometers. But uh, uh, we, uh, when we got on this boat, we were in the edge of a, I don't know what you call it, but the wind was blowing everything, it was blowing water over the side and there was a hundred of us on there. And we were trying to bail the water out, the pumps didn't work, and we were trying to bail the water out with buckets, you know. And uh, I wasn't much help because I couldn't, my legs were so stiff I mean, from very very, I couldn't help very much. But we finally got out of that squall and uh, got down to Mendenhall and uh, they had trucks to take us in, you know, to uh, the Val Penal Colony. And uh, we had, oh, well, we had a few people escape there, two people escaped, and then five people escaped. They caught one of them and cut his head off. And, uh, but that was to teach you not to escape, you know. And when the two people escaped, they took ten people out. One of them was that picture in there, one of them is dead now, lived in Odessa, Texas. But they marched them out there, ten of them, to shoot them. Which they didn't shoot them, thank goodness. Uh, but anyway, that was to teach you not to escape. You know, so we, we stayed in, uh, they had a guard tower. And uh, we had some people from, uh, we call it the Pineapple Plantation. They were in the Air Force, of course. They got captured, you know, down in Mindanao. So they brought them in. And as luck would have it, I had a fellow by the name of Harold Darling. He was from Monterey. Well, I was from Salinas. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, I'll say more about that later, but his sister. Uh, uh, he didn't make it home. But anyway, he gave me a, they hadn't taken the food away from me. They had canned food. He gave me a can, a can of sweet potatoes and of course, he, he didn't know at the time, <laughs> I guess, that they weren't, and he gave me a blanket and gave me another can, or a, some, I don't know, another can of something, I don't know. And he was my buck partner there. So uh, they brought those in, and then they brought another thousand down from uh, Commander Duan. And when the guys, from a pineapple plantation, seen what kind of shape they were in, the ones from Command One. Then they kind of knew what they were in for. But uh, we raised rice there for uh, Japanese troops called it Mactan. And we'd take a little train, go out to the rice paddies, and uh, raise rice. We raised rice. They're, they were a little behind times. The way you planted rice, the POW stood on this side of the of the rice paddy, and another one stood over here with a string across. Mm -hmm. Then they had all these seedlings, and you would plant as far as you could reach, you know. And then they'd move the string and plant again. And uh, we we used uh, oh kind of. Uh, Brema bulls and carabals. We used carabals mostly in the rice field. And you'd wade around in this feces, you know, because that's what it is, is, is water and carabao feces. And, and if they decided they wanted to lay down, you know, they couldn't breathe through their skin so Well, they would lay down, you know, and you, you couldn't move them. They, they, they were there. The Japanese come out and beat on them and didn't pay any attention to them at all. They'd lay down, you know. but. Anyways, uh, anyway, a lot of the uh, people, uh, when we started harvesting rice, they would, uh, the rice would cut them and they'd get sores, you know, uh, and you could actually see the bone, you know, it just, you know, they'd, and uh, they would finally, you know, after four or five days, well, naturally they'd just, just die, you know, when it hit their heart. But anyway, uh, we were there for a while, and uh, 
Japanese finally decided that they were going to uh, take us to Japan. The last, I forget how many, uh, I have a book in there that tells, tells about it. I think it's 30,000, 30 people or something. That our submarines sank the boats because they weren't marked POW. And by this time in 1944, our, our subs were out. And we were on three different boats. The last boat was for 62 days. And the boiler kept breaking down. And altogether we were on, on ships for 86 days, which is longer than anybody was on a boat going to Japan. But af after a while, uh, the boiler kept breaking down on this old boat that we were on. And uh, the uh, convoy went off and left us, which was the best thing that ever happened. Because the, our submarines see this one old boat out here, it wasn't worth sinking, you know. So we finally made it to Japan, and they put us to work in a copper factory. But during this trip, if somebody died next to you, you know, because we weren't getting any food, you know, to speak of, you know, just a little bit of rice, and they would lower the rice bucket along with the crapper bucket. At the same time, people sleeping underneath the stairs, you know. Because we, we had one guy, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Mills and uh, Colonel McGuire, jumped overboard and escaped on the ship. So they put us all in a hole, you know, and wouldn't let us go topside and get any air or nothing else. So if the guy died, they'd leave him, leave him down there for a couple of days, and then they'd haul all of them up, and throw them overboard, you know, when they when they. But uh, and they made us load rock salt onto that boat, you know. We didn't get any salt or anything, but you know, they made us load rock salt on there, so the POWs got a board off and got in there. And they were, urinating in there and defecating and everything else, they run it for the Japanese, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, uh, we finally got to Japan they started feeding us barley instead of rice, which some of the guys couldn't couldn't eat, you know. I never had any trouble. Someone asked me the other day if I still eat rice. I said, Lord, yes, I never did get enough of it, you know, which we didn't. And, uh, but we started eating barley, and they, this was that camp there, the picture of that mm -hmm. camp where the ocean washed the tidal wave, washed the latrine through the barracks, and, and, and we had a, just like an old barn with a, a thing down the middle, you know, uh, open space down the middle, and there was ten bays, on, on, there was bays on each side. Mm -hmm. Ten people slept on the bottom, ten here, ten up here, and ten up here. And the uh, only thing they gave us was plenty of tea. But we'd have to bring in pieces of wood and build a fire, you know, and if you were lucky enough to be able to get up to where this thing was about two foot long, about two foot high, and maybe a, a foot wide, and hang your canteen there, if you were lucky enough to be able to get up there with you know, you got 40 people in that, in that bay, uh, and then we'd drop the tea in the canteen, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, one time, one of the guys said, you know, we were all hungry. He was following the Japanese guard, you know, they carry everything on their head. And he was following this Japanese guard down in this middle of this place, and he reached up and got something off it off the tray. Well, that he didn't get caught that time, but the next time he got caught. So they take him around and lean the ladder up against the building. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. They, we had three guys. We'd have air raids, you know, our planes would come over. Mm -hmm. And they'd bomb the factory, and usually at night, and then they'd bomb Nagoya across the bay from us. They kept that thing on fire. That's where they built Japanese built airplanes. They kept that on fire for about, I don't know, from April on. But anyway, uh, when we were in this in this camp, uh, the Japanese 
Christians have community bathtubs. You know, they're about so deep and they're heated. And they'd let us take a bath every, you know, it smell good. <laughs> but they'd let us take a bath, you know, every week or so. But it's always the same water. The only thing about it was warm, you know. Mm -hmm. You get in there, because it gets cold over in Japan. And uh, uh, I know that the day that we had the earthquake, ten of us were pushing these little V-shaped railroad cars, but it knocked them off the tracks, you know. And they had a 580-foot smokestack, which was the tallest in one in Japan, I guess, supposedly. And uh, someone said, look at Dachbo. Dachbo means to bow, which they made us bow in front of that thing every morning when we went over there. Said, look at Dachbo. Well, about, about a, a fourth of it came off, you know, during the earthquake. And pieces of concrete, you know, half as big as this room. And we would have been down there underneath that in another five minutes with it because we were pushing this down there to this uh, ore down to the blast furnace. And uh, so the only one that got killed during the earthquake was a Japanese. He was on a, a conveyor belt way up high and it knocked him off, which we, you know, we cried for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> him, him getting hurt or dying. But uh, they gave us little uh, wicker baskets you know, about two foot wide and about eight or ten inches deep with a handle on each side. So you'd rake this ore into this basket and you'd pick it. And you never knew whether you were going to pick up ten pounds or forty pounds. I mean, that's the difference in, in ore. Well, of course, we couldn't pick up forty pounds anyway. So we'd just rake a little bit in there and take it over and dump it into the, the car. But... Uh, I know I was in the hospital with this broken foot, and the only thing they they could do, you know, our doctors didn't have any medication, so they put a piece of wood down on the bottom of the back and put a heel on it, you know, and, and wrapped it up. And when they unwrapped it, uh, uh, the, it was, had stuff on it, pull the skin off, you know. So, but I was a lot luckier than the one sitting next to me that got that killed, mashed his back, you know. But uh, anyway, our planes would come over and they would strafe once in a while. So this one time, uh, the plane came over and, and strafed our building, killed a few people, some two Dutch prisoners that I can remember. So I ran outside on crutches, and they had an old empty uh, Japanese bathtub here, you know, it's probably 10 foot each way. It had sand in the bottom of it, and I dove into that thing, you know, and crutches and all. <laughs> and uh, Sergeant Bailey was, he, that was a medical sergeant, so-called, you know, he didn't have any medication, but he started to run out the door, and when he did, the uh, plane shot off the ankle here and the knee here. So uh, uh, this Dutch doctor, you know, this is kind of gruesome, but it actually happened. This Dutch doctor used a regular saw to saw this leg off, and you know that's all he had. And the Japanese gave him one can of ether, and this guy, and then he cut this off at the ankle. This guy made it home. I don't, I don't know how, but anyway, he, had, he came to see me in Paso Robles, and uh, he and his wife, Eva, he's, he's dead now, but, uh, you know, most of them are. But uh, the Japanese stacked Red Cross food in boxes out by the gate and let us march by. Well, it started to rain, so they had to move them in 
this building we were in upstairs and they boarded them up. You know, and they had uh, two by twelves. Well, this one friend of mine lives down in San Jose, Norman Rose. Uh, I was still smoking him. He, uh, some way he got him and two other guys got a board off and he brought me a carton of cigarettes over to the so-called hospital where I was, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally the Japanese, uh, our planes were coming over, and, you know, and bombing, and the Japanese finally let two of the POWs dig a foxhole right where I could just slide off in it rather than try to run with crutches in the sand, you know. So uh, that worked fine, except it got kind of lonesome in there but <laughs> when they were bombing, everybody else was out on the beach in foxholes, you know. But uh, anyway, that was where we got liberated, so I probably told you enough stuff. Is that all you need to know? You can tell us whatever you want. Okay. You have a long time. <laughs> uh, mm. How did you get to come home? Well, we, the, the Japanese, uh, they, oh, I forgot to tell you, we had six sets of brothers <laughs> and one father and son. See, we were National Guard and we were drafted in the Army, regular Army in February of 41, shipped to Fort Lewis. Some of us went back to Fort Knox, Kentucky, I did, and uh, then back to Fort Lewis in September. They brought us down to San Francisco on Angel Island. We shipped out on President Coolidge from Angel Island. And uh, uh, there's one, this Glenn Brokaw that I mentioned once, uh, he and his wife, my wife and I were had a double wedding before we went overseas in June of 41. And she's dead, his wife passed away. He's still living with his, he's, he's got his own house, but his daughter's down somewhere up Palm Springs. And he's, he's still down there. Uh, incidentally, we paid the preacher $2 a piece. You know, we weren't very rich then, so we gave him $4 for a double wedding. And we borrowed a guy's car to uh, uh, to use, and the fuel pump went out. That cost us $7.50 before we got married. But anyway, uh, I don't know. Oh, I, I was going, going to tell you about my tank drivers daughter that was three years old. You know, I told you he got executed. She knew absolutely nothing. He had a brother. He, that was a set of brothers, too. And the only brothers, my stepbrother and I, we weren't really brothers, but it was my stepbrother. None of the brothers got home, both of them, you know. Some of them, one or two got home. But, uh, <clears throat> My tank driver's daughter, we were down at Camp San Luis Obispo, the National Guard from Sacramento, or finally discovered us and wanted us to come. This is not too long ago, about four or five years ago. And they wanted us to go down where we trained, you know, his National Guard down at Camp San Luis Obispo. And it, I guess it was on the news, so uh, on TV. So his daughter, was out there. By this time, she's 60 years old, you know. And she was three years old when her dad went over there. So anyway, she had one of her daughters with her, real black hair. And so she was, he was part Indian, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, this gentleman came over and tapped me on the shoulder. This is kind of hard. And she, uh, he said, there's someone who wants to talk to you. So like I said, they knew absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Or she knew absolutely nothing how her dad was killed or anything. Because her mother, some way, had, was 
irritated because she never heard from either one of the boys. And uh, Patricia was actually raised by someone named of Grosso up here in uh, Nevada somewhere. But anyway, she wanted to know about her dad and uh, just generally had told me. And uh, I, she was married to a uh, art teacher at Cal Poly. And I asked him, I said, how much does she want to know? You know, because it's kind of hard to just come out and tell her that. So he said, well, she wants to know everything. She wants to know what happened to her dad. So I finally got around to telling her, but it was kind of hard, you know, tell her her dad was executed, you know. But, uh, and I've got several cards from her. Uh, you know, they, li they live in San Luis Obispo, which I think they're pretty well off. You know, he has quite a lot of money. And uh, she sent us a, a card the other day it's up on the thing up there. Just give me all of them and I'll, I'll pick hers out. <coughs> this one hurts me. Birthday cards and all this stuff. Uh, this World War II memorial. thing where you can send in and get a certificate, you know, for the one that, that was in the war. And so I, I sent his name in, mm -hmm. you know, because he's, he's pretty, and she sent me that, that card. Did you get any, any what medals did you get from the war? Did I what? What medals did you get? Oh, Lord. That you can remember. Well, we got, uh, I'd have to see them to, to tell you what they are. Sue? Uh, yeah. Oh, never. Go ahead and bring me that case of medals on the wall. Now, don't let the uh, glass slide out, you know, it slides out the top. On the top? I say it slides out the top. Is that a metal right there? No, oh, this is just a POW bolo tie. Oh. There's all, I got three of those. <laughs> but, but, but she, she decided I better wear this. <laughs> Are you, like, involved in the Elks Lodge or anything like that? No, I belonged to the Elks for a long time, finally took a demit. And, uh, Lies. Could, could you take a picture of that rather than me having to tell you what all of them are? You belong to the Lions Club, too. Oh, I belong to the Lions for a long time. What's the Lions? Now all of them. Oh, the Lions Club. What is that? Oh, uh, that's the name of it. Oh. Project down at Salinas, that's where we're all from. You got it? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's kind of hard. It slides out the top of the glass, does Oh, okay. I'll just set that. Did you wear any or wear any of these during uh, the war? Oh, no. The, we got these after the war. After this the is day. Purple Heart here for Wound in Action. And, and there's another Purple Heart. I think that's POW. Uh -huh. And this is different battles, you know. Yeah. So. Um, when did, like, you get released from? Oh, we got released uh, after the war was over. <laughs> I forgot to tell you about this. 
I was telling you about my stepbrother, oh, yeah. Edward Frost. Uh, after we got released, they took us out to the ships, you know, the hospital ships, mm -hmm. in these landing barges. And I thought, good Lord, I'm going to drown now because <laughs> it would go way down, you know, and you look up and here's a wave way up here. And, you go, and we finally got out to the hospital ship. So I was on a bed on, on you know, on a bunk on the top of the ship on the and this chaplain <clears throat> walked up and he said, Say, he says, Do you have any brothers over here? I said, No, I says, I have a stepbrother <clears throat> and I hadn't seen him since nineteen forty two because I forgot to tell you this, he had celebr malaria. So I gave Dr. Hickman quite nine tablets there for at Commander One. <clears throat> and not knowing whether he would give them to him or not, you know. But had three different camps, and he, the doctors could go back and forth, even though they had no medication. So uh, my stepbrother Edward Frost had cerebral malaria, which is affects the brain. And uh, he, he says he's going to die if he doesn't get quinine. Well, I still had about 60 quinine tablets, so I gave him 40, and he got all right. <coughs> so, and, and he did give them to him, which I quinine was like gold. You know, in the PW camp. So anyway, on this hospital ship, I was up on the top, laying there, and this chaplain walked up. He said, "You have any brother over here?" I said, "I have a stepbrother." And uh, he says, "What's his name?" And I told him, Edward Frost. He said, "Just a minute." He says he's downstairs getting deloused. You know, <laughs> they sprayed us and shaved us. You know. Afraid, I guess we had something which we possibly we could have, you know. Mm -hmm. That's cars, you know. And so I, I, I was pretty fat when I when I got out. I weighed uh, 83 pounds, so that's <laughs> we wouldn't have made it another year, you know. Yeah, you showed them the pictures, didn't? You? Oh yeah, I showed showed those little pictures. You can't take a picture of those, can you? Your dad said he could scan them. Uh, yeah, you can on the camera. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know when you take little snapshots on a disposable camera? Yeah. Well, that does it, too. We used to go over to the mall and show those pictures. You know, they had the POW exhibits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the last time, after the new management came into the mall over there, they wanted... Uh, insurance. Well, we found out it cost $365 a day. So naturally we, we, we didn't do it. So now they have them down at Yuba City Mall. Uh -huh. And I didn't go down there last year. I might go this year. It's too hard. To, we got easels. You know, I made some easels. Mm -hmm. It's too hard to put them together. You have to put the back on. Plus I got to have a probably a, a back operation. And just don't want to. You don't feel like. Don't feel like. Yeah. Doing it, you know. So I'd rather. Phil said he could he could scan those. And the reason I have all these skin cancers, this is not too good. The Japanese, when we were raising rice for them, mm -hmm. the only thing they'd let us wear was a g-string, you know. And I've had them on my legs and everywhere. You know, and they had them on my face. That's what these things are. We scraped them off the other day to see if they were all right. And had them on my arm, on there. But, you know, you, you know, the sun reflecting off the water in those rice paddies. You know, not oh, yeah. not too good for you. You know, it can give you skin cancer. Do you want anything else? Yeah, I should have been in here. I bet you forgot half of everything. <laughs> well, I can't remember all that stuff, should I? I know it. I'm too old to. <laughs> what else do you need? It's like you forgot about Edward. Yeah, well. <laughs> Is this from the war, too? This? Yeah. I don't know. I just. These two are underneath my arms, aneurysms, from using crutches.
stretches too long. There's only two things that will cause aneurysms in your arm, and that's trauma and crutches. You know. And he had both. This doctor down, I went down to UCSF. I went to the doctor here in town, Crowhurst. He said, now, he says, I might hit a nerve. He said, you'll lose the use lose the use of your arm if I do. She said, I want to tell you in advance. <laughs> well, my daughter is a uh, worker. She takes care of workers' comp for, in Reading for Shasta County. They're self-insured. She said, you're not going to him. So she called and got me an appointment with the uh, head vascular doctor down at uh, UCSF. Mm -hmm. And he says, what's the matter with that fool? He says, I'm not going to hit any nerve. He says, you'll be fine. <laughs> and I was. Mm -hmm. You know, this Crowhurst, I don't think he's even here anymore. And, but this, I, I don't know what that's from. I always tell him it's from her hit me with a roll of him. Can I get up for a minute? Yeah. Okay. Mm. I have to get up slow. Mom. Back up work is good. So it's trying to get spring. Mm -hmm. The first time. And I finally told him, I said, I can't handle myself.